We have a rather extended amount of scripture to read this morning. I'm going to be speaking to you on beauty and the beast from 1 Samuel 25. And uh, let's stand together, please, and we'll read the scriptures. Scriptures are printed in your book. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was a house altogether. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh into thine hand, unto thy servants and to thy son David. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There may be many servants, and I will say, break away from every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers? and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be. And he gave his servants and his men, good and every man and his sword, and they gird on every man and his sword, and they also gird on his sword, and they went up unto David about four hundred men, and took his sword, and they went up unto David about four hundred men, and two hundred of the Lord by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. Then Abigail made haste, and took the two pillows, and two bottles of wine, and five sheep ready dressed, and five measures of parched corn, and a hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and a big one of asses. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. And it was so, and she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert on the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met him. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted, and lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground. And fell on his feet, and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this be. Let not, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thy handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. Thank you. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Beauty and the Beast. David, the future king of Israel, had been with his men. He had 600 men. They had been out in the hills and in the mountains hiding from King Saul. And they would on many occasions protect the sheep and the sheep herders and the shearers of Nabal's men from marauding bandits and thieves and robbers. They never asked anything in return. They were just glad to protect Nabal's property because they were there and had the power to do it. But one occasion arose when the men were hungry and David didn't have food to feed them. So he sent down to Carmel 
to this man who was married to Abigail, Nabal. And he asked that they might share some food with him and his men because the men needed food. Nabal was a drunken salt. He thought only for himself. And he spent most of his time in drunkenness. And on this particular occasion, when David sent a request and some young men down to ask for food, he rudely castigated them and sent them off. He said, I don't have anything to give to you. It so offended David that David singled out 400 of his men, said, unleash your swords and march down on Carmel and we will destroy every living person on the plantation of Nabal. And one of the young men came running down to Carmel and told Abigail what was about to transpire. We're all about to be massacred. We're all going to be murdered by David and his men because of Na Nabal. Uh, Nabal. Nabal was rude to David, refused him any food, and he's coming with 400 men. He'll kill everybody. And immediately, this brilliant young woman, Abigail, knew exactly what to do. She saddled some asses, loaded them up with food, and said, you young men, take this food and go back to David and give it to David, and I will follow you. So she sent the food to David. David is seething in anger. And as she approached David, she fell on her knees, and she humbly entreated David not to do this awful deed of murdering all the people on the plantation, which would include her. And she gave most moving intercession to David, pleading with David not to do this terrible thing and kill all of these people and have blood on his hands. And David recognized that it was good advice. He said, blessed art thou. Blessed is your advice. I will accept it. And I will let Nabal and his people go. I will not march on them. Then Nabal was stricken with a stroke and died ten days later in a drunken stupor, leaving beautiful Abigail without a husband. And the story goes that David, learning about the death of Nabal, her husband, sent for her, proposed a marriage to her, and she hastened to David, and they became man and wife. This woman is one of the wisest, wittiest, beautiful women you can find anywhere in the Bible. We begin with verse 3. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. She was beautiful. But the man, her husband, was churlish and evil in his doings. Abigail, we'll look at her first. It cannot be said of her that she was without discretion. She was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. Like Rachel in the Bible, who was beautiful and well-favored. Like Esther, who was fair and beautiful. Like Sarah, Abraham's wife, who was a fair woman to look upon. Like Rebecca, who was fair to look upon. Like courageous Vashti, who was of a fair countenance. Like the daughters of Job, about whom it is written, no women found so fair as Job's daughter. She was evidently a ravishingly beautiful woman. And not only beautiful, but wise and brilliant. She knew what to do. And she was a woman who knew God. She could say, I know whom I have believed. We know she was a woman of God. Because she said, as the Lord liveth, 
She said in another place, the Lord kept you from coming to shed blood. And the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. And you fight the battles of the Lord. You are bound up in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And when the Lord shall have done according to all the good he has spoken, then she said, when the Lord have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thy handmaid. Here's a woman that over and over and over mentions the Lord to David. The Lord was her stay. The Lord was her hope. The Lord was everything to Abigail who was married to a drunken lout, a beastly type of a man. She could sing with any of us, standing on the promises of God my Savior, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Abigail, although she was wise and beautiful, was married to a bad husband. Abigail in her marriage sought good and found evil. She sought gladness and found grief. She sought silk and found calico. She sought gold and got pewter. She sought comfort and found a curse. She thought her husband would be a blessing, but he was a blight and a burden and a beast. I think without doubt, when she had been married only a month, she found herself a martyr of misery in matrimonial bonds. The roses in her matrimonial garden had become cactus plants. Her orange blossoms had turned to lemon peelings. She found her marriage was a molestation. Her marriage began on a bright morning and perished like a mushroom. Is it not strange that wise, beautiful women like Abigail, sensible Abigail, sweet Abigail, beautiful Abigail would marry such a lout as Nate. But we must remember that in those days women did not choose their husbands. Their parents chose who to marry them to for political purposes and financial purposes. And evidently in the providence of God for some reason God allowed her to be married to Nabal. You don't see creatures acting that foolish. You don't see a nightingale marry a jaybird. You don't see a dove mating a scorpion. You don't see a deer associating with a hog. You don't see sheep falling in love with wolves. You have to go to the human family to find such tragic abnormalities and tragic circumstances. Now we'll look at Nabal a moment. Nabal's advantages were great. He came from a good family according to verse 3. He was of the house of Caleb, an honored name in Israel. He had a respected ancestry, but he was a disgrace to the family line. He was a rotten apple on a tree family tree. He had a good wife, beautiful Abigail. And the name of his wife was Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of beautiful countenance. He enjoyed immense prosperity in verse 2. There was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep. He owned a palatial mansion in Maon. And he had a business home in Carmel where his business lay. But his character was bad. Notice in verse 3. Now the name of the man was Nabal. And God had a way of putting a name on people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And the name that he gave them through their parents indicated their character. You'll find that as you, as you look up the names of Bible characters. Every one of them had a name that indicated his character. This man's name was Nabal. Nabal means a fool. For he is, verse 17, such a man of Belial 
Belial is the devil. He is such a man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. He lived up to his name. He was a fool, and he lived up to his name. We read that he was churlish and evil in his doings. He was a drunkard. He was a railer. He was an abuser. He was an evil man who had no thought of God in his mind at all. He lived only for Nabal and no one else. He was as mean as the man who did not kiss his wife in five years and shot the man to death. Nabal's end was miserable. He died suddenly of a stroke. Nabal, verse 36, Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. He died unmourned, unheralded, unbereaved. He was a bad apple on a family tree. He was a no good man. And as a minister, for 62 years, I have been called to homes where there's domestic disturbances. I have been called to homes where the husband has beaten the wife unmercifully. I have been called to homes where brutish men have abused their sweet wives. It reminds me of something that happened. I read about this when I was pastoring some years ago. And it's a newspaper clipping. On a dark, cold evening last November, a Cheyenne, Wyoming, 16-year-old, Richard Janke, shot and killed his father. But the wife of the deceased husband testified as follows. My husband, she said, put on a good appearance to the outside world, but inside that house it was pure hell. She was a battered wife. Her children had been physically and emotionally abused since they were two years old. And then the son said on the witness stand, He used to beat my mother, sit on her, pounding away, her mouth foaming with blood, calling her slut and a fat spit. Last year when my sister got acne, my dad accused her of not washing. He dragged her into the bathroom and scrubbed her face so hard she began to bleed. He showed her how to brush her teeth. He scraped her gums so hard they bled. And when I was very young, I had terrible asthma. Dad got mad at me if I coughed, so I'd run into my room and cough into a pillow. One time when I was six years old, he filled my plate with so much food and forced me to eat it until I threw up. In the breakfast nook, there were three chairs. The one nearest the counter was Richie's chair. Deborah's was next to his, and Maria's faced the window. She points to a spot ten feet away, just inside the living room. My husband ate there on a small tray table, monitoring us. If the kids scraped their forks on their plates, he'd go berserk. So they ate with plastic spoons. Richie couldn't even go to the bathroom. My husband would pound on the door and shout, you got one minute, and he'd begin to count to 60. We were all trapped. There was no place to go. I remember my mother praying aloud that he'd be hit by a car, but it never happened. She wanted to leave him, but she was scared. On the sixth day of the trial, Richie's lawyer, James Barrett, summed up the case for the jury by declaring that the murdered father had murdered his son by inches, bits and pieces, day by day, and week 
by week. Now, that man's tribe is not extinct. There's still plenty of that kind around today. And now, they're on the verge of a massacre. David is marching to kill and murder the house of Nathan and all of his servants and his wife. Nate, Abigail saw that something had to be done and it had to be done quickly. She was an effective intercessor. She averted a massacre. She was a woman of good understanding. In verse 23, you see her bowing down in lowly obeisance at the soldier's feet. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet. She did obeisance unto David. She proved that a soft answer turneth away wrath. And she made a frank confession that wrong had been done on their part. She said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, and hear the words of thine handmaid, She's pleading with David to pause for a moment and let, her, let him hear her case. She's asking that David would put the blame on her instead of her wicked husband. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, the son of the devil, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him, but I, thy handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. She said, I didn't see these young men that came and asked for food. I would have given it to them. She said, I was unaware that Nabal had turned them away. Her suggestion was that when he becomes the king, he will be glad that he did not commit murder and genocide. And in the sun-lit memories of his evening time of life, he will be glad to remember that he was kept from such a terrible deed as shedding blood. She said in verse 31, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that, neither that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself, but when my Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. You talk about a moving speech. Here's Abigail pleading with David. Please don't do this. In the evening time of your life, you'll be so glad that you didn't die with this blood on your hands. Don't, don't do this. Please spare and put the blame on me. It's like the eloquent speech of Paul when he gave his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders and they fell on his neck and wept when he said, I shall see you no more. Like Judas appealed to Joseph that he would release Benjamin and not take Benjamin hostage. Moving speeches. I think of Patrick Henry in the days of the early colonies of America as he rode into the Congress for a meeting, he saw two men with their hands and their feet in stocks. And as he went in the building, he asked one of the congressmen, what have those men done that they should be put in stocks like that? They said, he said, what crime have they committed? And they answered, preaching the gospel. He said, preaching the gospel Great God, great God, for preaching the gospel, you put these men in stocks? He said, this is horrible. This is terrible. This has to be rectified and right now. And the presiding elder of the Congress said to the bailiff, 
Go immediately and release those men. How many times great events have turned on an impassioned speech by someone who with passion and conviction spoke the truth. Here's David's response to Abigail. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with my hand. He thanked her for her wisdom, and for preventing him from committing genocide and murder. Mary Carolyn Davis said, Women are doormats, and have been. They keep men from going in with muddy feet to God. The advice of a good wife is usually priceless, with the exception of Eve, and a few perhaps like that. Many a wife has kept her husband from making a terrible mistake. In verse 37, we learn that Abigail was rescued by the death of Nabal, just as we are rescued by the death of Christ. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal and his wife had told him these things that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. And we read in verse 38 it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. Abigail's life now has taken a turn for the better. How she did it, I don't know. But she stayed with this beast these many, many, many years. She refused to divorce him. She refused to leave him. She knew what the Old Testament taught about divorce. And so she refused to break away. She accepted the abuse. She lived with the abuse. And no doubt prayed many a prayer to God for deliverance. And God heard her prayer, smote Nabal, and the brute died. Now Abigail's life takes a turn for the better. In verse 39, when David heard that Nabal was dead, David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. He proposed marriage to Abigail after the death of Nabal. And she hasted on the ass to rush to marry David. And she became his wife. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers and went after, which went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. So a bad story ended good. But you say, preacher, what does this story have to do with the gospel? Oh, it has a lot to do with the gospel if you have ears to hear and eyes to see. Let me give you just a few points. In verse 24, we see a picture of the cross. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and fell at his feet, and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. You see the cross? We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. She pleads that the iniquity might be placed upon her. Just as Jesus presented himself on the cross, that the iniquity of us might be placed upon him. There's a picture of the gospel in the story of Abigail. And then again, it pictures the elect and how they come to Christ. In verse 17, it was tidings of impending doom which caused her to seek David. She knew judgment was on the way 
She knew they were all going to die. And so she sought David. And we know that judgment's on the way. But we have sought the greater David. God's Son. The greater David. The Lord Jesus Christ. To avert the judgment that we knew was coming toward us. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Secondly, in verse 23, she took her place in the dust before him. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted before David and fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground. Do you not see a picture there of the poor sinner having heard the gospel, realizing the impending doom of judgment, falls on his knees and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's a picture of it in Abigail before David. And then again in verse 24, she came to him confessing iniquity. She fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. Let me bear the iniquity of Nabal. Just as Jesus on the cross bore the iniquity of all of us who are believers. Then in verse 28, Abigail sought forgiveness from David. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. Now it was Nabal that committed the wickedness, but she took the blame for it. She said, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. Because she knew that she was in the family of Nabal. And she knew that David would slay, slay everyone in the village. And she asked forgiveness. And that's what we do, is it not? We ask forgiveness for our sins. Then in verse 28, she was absolutely persuaded of the goodness of David. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. And evil hath not been found in thee in all thy days. She's telling David she knows that he's good. There is no bad in him. He is perfection. David was a great man. And she lauded David with accolades that were truly deserved. He was a great man. And she said, the Lord is going to use you in a great way. And you are good. God is good. As I tried to point out last Sunday, God is good. Then she owned the exaltation of David. She knew that David had been anointed by Samuel to be the king of Israel. Saul was still on the throne. But David had been anointed by Samuel the prophet to be the next king of Israel. And she knew that. And all in Israel knew that. And she is looking forward to the day when he'll be exalted as the king of Israel. And she says in verse 30, It shall come to pass, when the Lord shall have done to my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. She said, I know you will be the king of Israel. The Lord is good. The Lord will keep his word. And then she in the seventh place, like the dying thief on the cross, begs to be remembered. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. Doesn't that sound like the dying thief on the cross? He said, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom, remember me. Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And Abigail parallels that prayer almost to the exact point. But when my Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, remember thine handmaid. Remember me, Lord. Don't leave me out. That's election. Don't leave me out. 
I want to be remembered when you become king of Israel. God remembered Noah. God remembered Abraham. God remembered A Rachel. And God remembered Hannah. God remembers His people. He has their names written in the Lamb's book of life. And He wrote those names down before the foundation of the world. Before they had done any good or evil. They were already His. He had their names in the Lamb's book of life. And one last thing, David granted her request and accepted her person and told her to go in peace. So David said in verse 35 unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. And when we came confessing our sins to God, humbling ourselves before the Lord, He says to us, See, I have accepted thy person. You are mine. I've accepted you. See, it's not a matter have you accepted Christ. It's a matter has Christ accepted you. The Armenians have got the cart before the horse. Now, it's true that we do accept Christ. And we must accept Christ. But only after He has accepted us. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. And He accepted us first before we accepted Him. And our salvation does not rest on whether we accepted Christ or not. It rests upon whether Christ has accepted us or not. In other words, did He elect you to salvation before the foundation of the world? If He did, then He has accepted you. And then you will assuredly accept Him. That's the way it works. All those that He's accepted will accept Him. There will be not one that will refuse to accept Him. All of His people will come to Him. Jesus prayed His great high priestly prayer in John 17. And He asked the Father to preserve those that the Father had given to Him. See, in electing grace before the foundation of the world, the Father gave a number of people to Christ as a bride to be His people. They were elected before the foundation of the world. If God gave you to Christ back before the foundation of the world, that's why you're saved today. Not because of anything you did. And you did some things that they were done after He had already saved you. Then you begin to do those things. The Armenians teach that God saves you because you do those things. No, 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 my friend. Read your Bible. As I've been telling you, it's after God has saved you that you repent, that you believe. And repentance and faith are gifts of God. They don't come out of your own emotion or heart. The Bible says God hath granted repentance to the Gentiles. And that faith is a gift of God and not of works lest any man should boast. If you have faith in Christ this morning, it's because God gave it to you. You didn't just muster it up. It was a gift from God. You say, Preacher, have you got a scripture for that? Yes, sir. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. And it may be this morning that you're here listening to the gospel. How that Christ died for you and rose again and ascended back to glory. And you want to do like Abigail. You want to fall at His feet and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because you have taken my iniquity. I trust in you. Maybe out over the internet, somebody listening to this sermon will be convicted of his bad behavior fall on his knees and ask God's forgiveness. I had an experience like that 
when I was a pastor, a very young pastor, a woman came to my door at 4 o'clock in the morning and she said, my husband came home drunk. He's been beating I and the two little girls. And he's a mean man and he's a terror to the community. And she said, he did a strange thing. He asked me to come get you. He lived just two blocks down from the church. She said, I don't understand why he would do that. But she said, he's a, he's a mean man, and if you don't want to come, I wouldn't blame you. He's a violent man. I said, I'll come. Give me a moment to get dressed. I got dressed and went with her. We walked back at two blocks to that little old shack. And as we walked in, I saw him sitting there with his head in his hands like this on an old sway back bed. And as I stepped through the door, he stood up about six foot two inches tall with blackest eyes I had ever seen. And he looked right into my face and he said, Preacher, is your God able to save the most wicked man in New Mexico? I knew I had to answer. This was a violent man, half drunk. And I wondered, Lord, what should I say? And God gave me his scripture. And I looked him right in the eye. And I said, for he is able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And when I quoted that scripture to his face, he reeled back as though he'd been slapped in the face. And he fell over on his knees at that old bed and began to pray. And I knelt beside him and I said, let me read you a scripture here. He said, preacher, it doesn't, doesn't need to be. God's already done it. The Lord has saved me. The next Sunday morning, in the little First Baptist Church, <clears throat> this man, who was a terror to the neighborhood, who fought with everybody and was a drunkard, was sitting in the church Sunday morning with his wife and two little girls. His face beaming with the joy of the Lord in his salvation. Oh, what a God we have. His power knows no bounds. There is no man beyond the reach of His grace if God chooses to extend grace to him. Oh, I pray this morning that as God laid this message on my heart, that somewhere, someone will benefit from it. Jesus means a thousand times more to us than, that he, than David did to Abigail. Your greatest possessions will offer you no condolences in the day of trouble, but Jesus will. The world will not help you drink the cup of pain, but Jesus will. The friends of earth may not stand by you, but Jesus will. The philosophies of men will shed no light on your darkness, but Jesus will. And kings will not come back in power, but Jesus will. I wonder this morning if there's one here that wants to come and say, yes, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. And now I'm coming to receive Him. Or maybe you want to come and be baptized to show your obedience to Him. Or maybe you want to come and put your membership in Trinity Baptist Church as we sing and as we stand together. Please, will you sing with me? Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am.
Brother Jim, would you dismiss us this morning, please? Thank you. Speaking through our pastor today, Lord, helping us and giving us understanding of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here, to worship and glorify you, Lord. It's not about ourselves, Lord, it's just about you. Help us to stay focused upon you throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout all of our lives, at all times, Lord. Seeking you out and not seeking the world. We love you, Lord, and thank you, Lord, that you loved us first. Thank you, Lord. Guide us and protect us to stay in Christ Jesus.